John Gotti had pinned three murders on his underboss. One of the few times in life, John Gotti was actually embarrassed. He wanted to dive under the table. Sammy turned white and then red. He was just furious. The judge denied bail. Sammy, his boss, and Frank Locascio were each locked up in separate jail cells in the isolation unit of New York's Metropolitan Correctional Center. Sammy, a creature of habit who rarely strayed from his daily routine, was back in jail for the first time in 17 years. Unlike Gotti, you know, he had never really done a stretch of, you know, two years here or five years there. I think jail was strange and frightening to him. Locked in his cell, 23 hours a day, the bull lay on his cot and brooded over Gotti's betrayal. When they were finally released from the isolation unit after a month, Gotti invited his underboss to a man-to-man -man discussion. John basically told Sammy, I was just talking, Sammy, what are you worried about? What's the big deal? And Sammy said, hey, you were talking about me behind my back. That's not the way things are supposed to run. The bull looked at the pieces on the chessboard and decided that the boss was setting him up as a pawn that could be sacrificed. Sammy was 46 years old and, if convicted, was likely to spend the rest of his life in prison. I think when he looked at his options then, he said, you know, life in here is not an option not for any code of honor. After nearly 10 months in jail, Sammy reached a fateful decision, one that would not only change his life forever, but would turn the New York underworld upside down. Gravano, the second highest ranking member of the most powerful crime family in America, would testify for the government. He would become the thing he had always hated, a rat. Sammy sent a message to the FBI. Two weeks later, he met secretly with agents and a prosecutor in the jury room of the courthouse about cutting a deal. This was the underboss of the family, the man who was used to communicate with all the other families, the man who knew all of the other bosses and underbosses and captains. This was the mother load. When his wife Deborah and daughter Karen came to visit him in jail, Sammy told them about his deal with the government. Karen. Shocked that her father was becoming a snitch, fled the room crying. Deborah stayed behind as her husband explained. He told her what he was going to do, uh, testify against Scotty, and go into the witness protection program. And she wouldn't do it. Uh, she said, you know, I can't put my children through it, and me. I think she said, that part of our life is your life, it's not mine. Deborah left the jail, and for the time being, left her husband as well. At midnight on November 8th, Sammy also walked out of the jail, leaving John Gotti and the mob behind forever. John Gotti sent a message to the fact that uh, part of my heart broke when my son was killed, the other part broke when you defected to the government. The bull was transferred to the FBI's training academy in Quantico, Virginia, where a deal was finalized. Gravano agreed to testify for two years in any case the government wanted. The most prison time he could get was 20 years. Back in New York, when word got out that Sammy had become a government witness, flyers were posted all over the city showing Sammy's head on the body of a rat. There are times where... Uh... He had pangs about cooperating. Uh, he had a lot of guilt for what he was doing, a lot of remorse. And he always had this constant fear of being abandoned by the government. On March 2nd, 1992, Gravano became the highest ranking member of La Cosa Nostra ever to testify against his boss. As he settled into his chair, Sammy ignored Gotti's stare. The jury listened as prosecutors led Gravano through a blow-by-blow -blow account of his life in the mob and the murder of Gambino crime boss, Paul Castellano. They believed him. They didn't like him. They didn't like him at all. He's not a likable guy in a lot of ways. <laughs> well, in all ways, frankly. Uh, but they believed him. Gotti's attorney, Albert Krieger, cross-examined Gravano. The bull stood his ground. 
He was contained, articulate, not responsive as the angry, blustering degenerate I now know him to be. I was a good, loyal soldier, Sammy announced near the end of his nine-day testimony. John barked, and I bit. On April 2nd, 1992, the jury found Gotti guilty of all murder and racketeering charges. Nirvana's attitude was Gotti tried to betray him, and Sammy took steps to see that that didn't happen. Like it was a chess game. Except uh, Gotti was playing with checkers. Gotti was sentenced to life in prison without parole at the U.S. Penitentiary in Marion, Illinois. Gravano, on the other hand, was about to become a free man. After helping to put his crime boss, John Gotti, in prison for life in 1992, Sammy Gravano spent the next two years testifying for the government. He became the most famous mob turncoat since Joe Valachi. Like Valachi, Gravano testified before a U.S. Senate hearing on organized crime. This one focused on the mob's corruption of professional boxing, including its practice of paying off fighters to throw bouts. And I believe if he would have knocked them out by accident, he would have picked them up. <laughs> <laughs> by the time he finished testifying, Gravano played a role in sending 37 people to prison. They included a juror, a cop, several union officials, four crime family bosses, nine captains, and over 30 mob soldiers. You never got guilty pleas from these characters before. You point Sammy at them and they give up because they know Sammy knows. Sammy was their boss. Gravano's own sentencing came on September 26, 1994. The bull faced up to 20 years in prison. Before sentencing Sammy, Judge Leo Glasser declared, there has never been a defendant whose impact on organized crime has been so important and so extensive. Judge Glasser sentenced the bull to five years in prison, plus three years of supervised release. With time already served, Gravano had less than seven months left in prison. To Gotti's defense attorney, the sentence was a blot on the justice system. Gravano is filth to his core. What he has done is he has found a way to bargain for his freedom, and we buy it. The 37 people who were convicted and in jail because Sammy Gravano testified would be on the street, themselves killing people still if we didn't reward testimony of accomplice witnesses. Gravano walked out of a federal prison for government witnesses on April 19, 1995. A free man of sorts. John Gotti had allegedly put a two million dollar bounty on his head. He had just turned 50 years old and was about to be reborn in the witness protection program. Before assigning him a new identity, the government did a psychological evaluation of Gravano conclusion was hardly reassuring. The likelihood of violent behavior is substantial, the report noted. He continues to be violent despite his age. Let's say he opened a video store. And, you know, uh, a guy opened a video store across the street from him. And he'd say, hey, you know, it's a small town. Why don't you open a video store somewhere else? In his old life, he'd firebomb the guy's door. If he'd reopened, he'd kill him. Now he can't do that. And the question is, you know, can he adjust? Has he adjusted? As the bull tried to start a new life with a new identity, he showed he was anything but predictable. He had always hugged the shadows as a gangster. But rather than sink safely into anonymity, Gravano soon dropped out of witness protection and thrust himself back into the public eye. In a best-selling book written with Peter Moss and in a, in a television interview with Diane Sawyer, Sammy appeared without a disguise, giving the country a good look at his plastic surgery. Just as his crime boss once had, Gravano now seemed to crave the spotlight. By exposing himself, he inadvertently opened the legal doors to a group of people who were as eager to hunt him down as John Gotti, the relatives of the bull's 19 murder victims. 
The book allowed them to file wrongful death claims against Gravano under New York's Son of Sam law. Roseanne Massa's brother Mike DeBat was one of Sammy's victims, most of whom were associated in some way with the mob. Nobody's proclaiming anybody to be an altar boy, but before these men sold their souls, they were somebody's father, somebody's brother, somebody's son, and their lives had meaning to people. It's good for Sammy Gravano to know that he can't entirely wrap himself up in the American flag because out there are people who, under color of law, are seeking to recover the money that he's made from the murders that he committed. When Gravano returned to the stand in 1997 to testify against Genovese crime boss, Vincent the Chin Giganti, the families of the Bulls murder victims converged on the courthouse. What's Gravano doing here? He's selling more books. During cross-examination, Giganti's defense attorney forced Gravano to admit that he hoped to make nearly a million and a half dollars from his book and a related movie deal. Giganti was convicted. The wrongful death suits are still pending. So many lives were touched by the actions of this one man. That this one man, look what he's done to his own family. I, you know, I think about his son and his daughter. Imagine the weight of the world of, on his son's shoulders. I think about this kid, his daughter. What happens the day she gets married? Sammy gonna walk her down the aisle? Deborah Gravano sold their Staten Island home and moved to another state with daughter Karen and son Gerard. She and Sammy have divorced, though he occasionally calls to check up on their children. Deborah now knows for certain that Sammy was responsible for killing her brother. He said uh, the thought of putting uh, his loyalty to Cousin Oscar above his loyalty to his wife and his children was something he was going to have to live with uh, for the rest of his life. Since Gravano is no longer in the witness protection program, he must fend for himself against those who would like to see him dead. Of course, many of those people are now behind bars. But there's always a young Turk looking to become a made man, just as Sammy once did. He said he couldn't discount the thought that some kid would try to make a name for himself by taking him out. And he looked away in the distance as if he were seeing this kid approaching. He looked back at me and said, boy, he better be good. The bull has once again disappeared into the shadows. The thing that makes him unique is that he turned at the top of his game and help bring down 30 to 40 guys in and around the Gambino crime family. It amazes me how many different hats this man wore. He wore the hat of a businessman, of a father, of a husband, of a murderer, of an extortionist. He is uh, trying 